fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back to the House of Mystery. Today's mystery, the Jody Arias Trial. And joining us is the defense attorney for Jody Arias and author of Trapped with Miss Arias. It's book one of three is Kirk Nurmi. Welcome to the show, Mr. Nurmi. Well, you're very welcome. It's my pleasure to talk to you here today. So, um, quite a, quite a story. Uh, when did um, you find out you were going to be on the case? Well, I was assigned the case back in um, about August of 2009. At the time, uh, which is obviously a long time ago, I was working as a, a public defender in the uh, Capitol unit. And I kind of tell some of the details in the story in the book because uh, a lot of people think I chose Miss Aries as a client, that sort of thing, uh, you know, so I could get on TV, things of that nature. But, no, the, 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 the truth of the matter was that uh, it was kind of my my turn up, my defense team's turn up on the uh, rotation, so to speak, to get a new case. And uh, Ms. Arias' former attorneys had uh, withdrawn, and a, a file with the name Jody Arias came to on, on my desk, so to speak. So now when you first um, uh, got the case and, and saw it, um, what, what was your first impression of the case? Well, when I first was assigned the case, all I knew is that, you know, obviously the my client was female, and uh, I had my supervisor at the time had told me that she had partaken her in this uh, CBS 48 Hours interview. So I didn't really know much more than that, because the whole file hadn't been transferred over from the uh, prior attorney, so I didn't have all the evidence, I didn't have all the facts. Yeah, and and certainly one thing that stuck out to me uh, is the fact that she was female. Uh, as a capital defense attorney, uh, you really don't get too many female clients. And even even uh, in your career building up to that and murder cases and things like that, as you might guess, a vast majority, you know, 95, 98% of your clients are male. And so that stood out to me. And then, uh, you know, having someone who had, had been on TV and having the chance to watch her on TV and realize that she was articulate and well-spoken um, was also something uh, that stood out to me. So when you actually met Jody uh, for the first time, uh, did she uh, live up to what you had thought she was going to be? Well, I had some suspicions, and I go into the book the reasons why, but, you know, I, I felt as if, you know, that she was, you know, a little flirtatious, a little, you know, possibly a victim of sexual abuse. So some of those things started formulating in my head. And, yeah, ultimately she kind of she kind of conformed to that. I tell the story in the book. You know, when I, because when I met Jody Arias, you know, she was just another client, and it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't what it became in, in you know, January of 2013 when the cameras were rolling. So it was fairly routine to go visit a new client, but I tell the story in the book about how it was, it was like chit-chatting at Starbucks um, as opposed to an attorney meeting a client for the first time. So um, it was definitely unique in that respect. So do you think that she never thought she'd ever be tried for it, or if was she real casual then? Well, I think she was very casual, but, you know, it's hard to say... You know, I can't obviously read her mind, so it's hard to say what her motivations for acting a particular way uh, during that initial meeting were. So now, what made you go into um, write the book now that it's it's done? What made me? Yeah. 
Was there something? Yeah, well, I, I think there were, a, there were a lot of reasons. I mean, there was, there was, you know, there was a sensational aspect to the case and that, that drew people's attention beginning on January 2nd, 2013. Um, and I wanted to get behind that and help people understand the backstory of what leads up to a case like this and, and the truth about why I was Ms. Harris's lawyer, things of that nature. Um, because there were a lot of uh, misconceptions about that. There were a lot of misconceptions about myself and my defense team. Um, so I kind of wanted to clear the air. And going back to that sensationalism and, and the true reality of the story, you know, I, I, this is ultimately a tragedy. I mean, we had this, this young man, who was, this beloved young man who was, was murdered, and we have a, a young woman who was, uh, struggling through life and finding her way, but uh, who is now spending the rest of her life in prison for, for killing that, that beloved young man. And, it, and it's a sad tale, and it's a tragic tale, and it's a tale about toxic relationships and the need uh, for us to separate ourselves from those relationships. So, you know, I wrote in part as well with the hope that somebody might really look at this relationship just beyond the sensational aspects and say, there's a lesson to be learned here about about both parties, you know, getting away from each other and and moving on with their lives. You know, we had a not to ramble on, but you know, here recently in Phoenix area, we had a, a young girl. There were high school girls, and there was a murder suicide. Uh, and, you know, and these girls hadn't even got out of high school, and at least one of them couldn't find a way to get away from this relationship and move on. And you know, now both of them are dead. And and avoiding tragedies like that is, is something that I hope, uh, maybe even if it's just one that I never know about, um, my hope is that, that some of those tragedies will be avoided. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, what do you think the sensation was? Like what, what pulled this case into such a media spotlight? I mean, uh, back in 2009, you weren't expecting this to be on, like, um, all the TV shows and being followed, and it was kind of a CNN all-day event. Yes, it was. Uh, there was there... I, I always say I don't think any any one of us um, could have anticipated any any of the players involved could have anticipated that it became what it became. I mean, there was certainly, um, you know, ultimately before the before the opening statements were made, we knew it was going to be covered. We knew it was going to be live streamed, that sort of thing. But it was such a, a, a sensationalistic, all-encompassing, you're right, all day on HLN, right? Yeah. All day coverage, Jody, Jody, Jody. And, um, you know, I, when people ask me what I think the fascination is, I'm always, I, I, I say that I was in the middle of the storm. And so I wasn't part of the, the watching public, obviously. And so I, I tend to throw it back and say, you know, what what do you think the sensational aspects of, of it is, which I, I guess I would pose to you. But, you know, I certainly think, um, you know, we have elements of, of sex and, and uh, members of the other or, or parties to this story that were that some people considered attractive and they were having sex and forbidden sex and there was naked pictures. And, and certainly I think that, that was part of it, and, and as time goes on, it definitely sees that that for whatever reason, the um, thirst for information or anything about Miss Arias has not not been quenched. Society still seems to uh, have an interest in in her and her exploits. Now, does that change you and the defense team when you're trying to do a job? Now. Um, when there's a lot of media, you know, Nancy Grace is sitting in the in the audience. You've got all yeah. this going on. Uh, I, I can't imagine personally. Um, I'd feel like I was being watched and analyzed for every move I made, every word I said. I, I don't know if it, being self conscious, I would be worried about every little thing. Am I wearing the right tie? You know, because you've got so much comment on it and it's all day long and by every show you you turn to i i, I doesn't that affect you um personally and when you're trying to do a job 
Well, I mean, I think to to some degree it does, uh, you know. It, and, but it's probably in a way that that is in immeasurable, and that I can't tell you exactly how. Um, you know, I knew I had heard uh, stories that uh, there was, uh, you know, blocks uh, related to the ties I wear. I wore. I tend to tend to be a guy who wears colorful ties and socks and. I know that there was commentary on that. Some of that you just laugh off as, as silly. I'm not going to, you know, change how I dress. But, but it is it is a, a strange feeling. But at the same time, the the focus had to be on uh, the job I had to do. You know, when I walked into that courtroom, I wasn't there to serve my interests. You know, I wasn't there to say show off my skills for uh, future clients that, to, to want to retain me. I wasn't there, you know, so CNN would hire me down the road. I was there to save Miss Aries' life, and that was really, I think, the mission to the, to the credit of the other members of my defense team. That was the mission all along, and I think by fixating on that, if you will, um, that at least helped... Um, deal with that, what could have been a potential distraction. Yeah, and, and I, I just would imagine, I, I'd feel like I was being uh, analyzed uh, all the time. I'd feel like um, when you're going for your driver test and you have the instructor in the in the car, like, uh, that's how I would feel, but uh, it's commending that you can do it um, and did the job. Um, now, did you actually not want to be on this case? Well, I tell you, I, I, I tell the story in the book about how, you know, after, towards the end of 2010, you know, I'd had Nefarious's case for you know, not quite a year and a half at that time, I guess. But I had also been a member of the Capital Unit of the Public Defender's Office for about three years, two, two and a half, three years in that ballpark. And I'd had a couple trials, uh, and I realized, you know, these trials are draining. The shortest one was three months. They take away from your personal life. They take away, you know, other potential professional endeavors. They just, they're all encompassing. And I decided, look, you know, this wasn't doing capital cases, wasn't um, what I wanted to keep doing, what I wanted to keep spending the rest of my career doing. Um, so I decided toward the end of 2010 that I would uh, leave the public defender's office uh, and leave doing capital work and, you know, kind of get into more common areas of practice that I work in as sex crimes and other felonies and uh, kind of just get back to that and go into private practice and, and help good people who, who had criminal matters. And, you know, when that happened, uh, I made, uh, I plan on leaving the public defender's office. It was common practice at that time for, you know, new counsel to take over and not much was, um, really ever said about that. But, uh, you know, the, the court in, in this matter, uh, had other ideas and I respect Judge Duncan and her ruling and, and in February of 2011, when she made that ruling, or not February, I guess it was ultimately April, uh, proceeding started in February. But when when she made that ruling, I respected it, and I had a duty to my client, and my plans for my private practice had to be severely altered. But I went forward and, and, and again, endeavored to save Miss Arias' life. So is that where you kind of got the title, uh, Trapped with Miss Arias? Is that kind of what you're referring to ultimately that's it yeah i mean i was uh i was trapped in once once april of of 2011 that really came out you know i was trapped and i kind of tell the story in the book about how i feel like miss arias knew that i was trapped how she kind of threatened me saying you know you're gonna come you're gonna do what i want and i you're gonna quickly handle my case or you know, I'm going to, you know, say bad things about you and, and damage your career. And the one thing about Miss Arias is that she had the ability to do it because she always had the uh, the bully pulpit uh, of the media from which to, to do that. And, and she did that at certain times at the end of the trial. So 
Um, but uh, my fixation, again, uh, was to uh, focus on saving her life, and everything else had to, had to wait for another day. I, I, and I that's know. part of the, and that, that yeah. goes back, excuse me, that goes yeah. back to part of my, my motivation to writing the book that I probably neglected to bring up earlier was this, this idea that I wanted to set the record straight. And Nasarius was going to say these things, and I wanted to make sure that the record was straight. Uh, you know, I, and I have to wonder, I, I, now in the book, um, you you talk a lot what it, it was like to deal with Miss Arius, um, and that's without cameras as well. Um, so is, is there something in particular that uh, you could tell people, that uh, listeners, that they would get when they're reading the book about that? Well, you know, they would they would they would learn a bit about the process, a bit about the rights of the defendant, um, a little bit about what areas a defendant has control over and what areas a defense attorney has control over, that sort of thing. And so they would learn a little bit about that interaction. Certainly, I had to restrict the stories I told in the book uh, because of attorney-client privilege, but I tried to speak to as much as I can based on some of the disclosures uh, she has made publicly in her interviews and some of the things um, that she did that were just out of bounds, like I say, like the the, the threats to me that, that I would characterize as being extortion, um, you know, so those I could come forward with. But I had to be very careful, so I gave everybody as much behind-the-scenes uh, insight as I could. Insight. So- how did you take the threats like that from her? Did you think she was quite capable? Well, you know, under normal circumstances, you you might laugh it off, right? Who cares? And and nobody's going to you know nobody's going to listen that sort of thing. But you know, Miss Arius was going to she had that bully pulpit. It, when you know when, if if you're familiar, you know, on in between the time that the jury was deliberating her life. And during the first trial, she was giving interviews. She was giving interviews. And so, yes, yeah, she had that microphone, and she had people from both national networks and uh, local local affiliates, uh, which would be obviously my primary client base, you know, saying, hey, he didn't do that good a job, and he, he didn't do this, he didn't do that. And so, yeah, in that sense, she did have the ability to, to make good on that. So... You know, that there there's certainly something to that, but but again, my duty to Miss Arias was to get past that and save her life. That was my ethical duty and and then like I say, I deal with that down the road and that's that's what I'm doing now. I see, yeah, because you you call this part one of three. So you're gonna be doing two more books. Uh, what what direction do you go in for both books? Well, I, I tell you, just to give a little backstory, I, I did not sit down and write with the idea that, first of all, that it was going to become a book. I was kind of writing for myself and kind of processing through some of the things we've talked about uh, here today. But as I began thinking about maybe wanting to come forward with this, these things, I sat down thinking, oh, I'm going to write one book and, and get it over with. But it was five and a half years of my life. And it became, you know, too much. I don't know if you've ever written a book or not, but it became too much for me to conceptualize to how to tell my story. So the first book became the things that happened before trial. And the second book will deal with the things that happened uh, during that first trial. And I'll talk about the witnesses. I'll talk about my thoughts and uh, on certain witnesses, on certain bits of evidence, that sort of thing. And in my third book, I, I'll ultimately talk about what happened since that second trial, the uh, what happened during the, the second penalty phase, and I'll give some of my thoughts, my ultimate thoughts, on what I believe happened on June 4th, 2008, uh, because it changed from, from my thinking changed from 2013 to, to the completion of the trial. And so that's that's kind of the direction it's going, kind of in the in the in the chronological order that the uh, that the trial went in. And, and so, do you, do you think Jody Arias has read your book yet? Uh, I I'm going to guess yes. I have no idea. I you know, but uh, 
I suspect I suspect she has. I know she's an avid reader. She has a book club, from my understanding. So she's quite uh, quite intelligent, isn't she? She's quite a bit more than what people thought she was. Well, you know, there is there is certainly a complexity to that, and one of the things I describe her as in in my book is an, an intelligent uh, five year old. And that comes with some some limitations on that uh, on that intellect. But um, yeah, there, there's no there's no doubt about it. She is is an intelligent individual. And so now this whole uh, trial and and these these years working on all this, now that's kind of um, affected your life too, hasn't it? Well, I think so. I mean, you know, I, I, I talk about the some of the things in life that you don't necessarily uh, value that until you lose them. And, you know, one of the things uh, that's most prominent uh, since the cameras turned on, so to speak, on January 2nd, 2013, is my anonymity. Uh, before then, while I had done some high-profile cases, I was never a person that would be you know, recognized in public or, or talked about or, as you said, analyzed ad nauseum on cable TV. But when the cameras started running on January 2nd, 2013, that that became the case. And, and my my wardrobe, my weight loss between two trials, you know, I, I remember having the surreal experience between the two trials of sitting and watching a, a cable news show where they were discussing whether or not I had had you know, lap band or gastric bypass or dream whether or not I'd, I'd gotten hair plugs before. And so, you know, those kind of things are certainly um, experiences that I that I wouldn't have had, uh, you know, had I not been been on this case. But so, yeah, it, it certainly affects your life. I mean, I, I probably wouldn't be talking to you here today if, if I had not been uh, Miss Aries' lawyer. So there's the good and there's the bad. Yeah, yeah. And and has it changed your opinion on the whole justice system? Like, do you feel differently now after than you did before? Well, you know, I'm I'm still, you know, a big believer in our justice system. I don't think there's any, any better in the world. And, uh, you know, I'm still a philosophically regardless you know not miss area specific but philosophically against the death penalty and that's certainly some of what motivated me and guided me through the trial but you know i think what what the areas case does or what the areas case will mean moving forward is it will be the starting point from which uh other trials that that face this kind of high profile scrutiny um, from which they are assessed in, in the sense that, you know, the courts really haven't had to deal with social media in the way that they had to deal with it in the Arias case. You know, the tweeting, the, the threats, the, the live streaming, the, the, the Facebook, the effect that it could have on witnesses, the fake reviews of, of expert witness books uh, that were put on Amazon, and things of that nature, and it becomes so. And so, courts are going to have to, when when they're confronted with this issue, are going to have to look at the areas case and say, "Look what happened here. Do we want this to happen? How does this affect justice?" I actually wrote a piece in the New York uh, Daily News a, a few weeks back, talking about the impact of social media, and courts are going to have to answer the question: Is what role, if any, does social media play? Uh, on these trials and all participants, not only the judge, the, but the jurors as well. Could they have access to social media? Could they be outed on social media? So there's a lot of impact th- that the Arias case will have, I think, moving forward on, on, on trials. Uh, do you find that affects you even now? I can't help but think, because I know being in the in the public eye myself, not, not like to a trial extent, but um, don't you... How do I say, you know, comments, like people will write comments that say on your book and uh, people will send messages. And I'm sure your law office gets um, crank calls, as you'd call them. Uh, isn't that all part of that social media? And, and do you think it's a good thing? or? Well, I don't necessarily think it's it's a good thing that, that um, 
that there's that kind of that there's that kind of access. You know, uh, uh, people are certainly entitled to their opinions, but they're certainly not. I guess maybe your question is it's such a such a hard one to answer, but you know, social media, especially Twitter, tends to come with threats and and things of that nature because of the anonymity of the of the person and. So there's a there's a lot of negative there that, that that comes with Twitter. We you know I've written blogs on my website about cyberbullying and things of that nature. So there's a lot of negative that that comes with uh, with that sort of attention. I'm not sure if that really addresses your question or not, but but it's it's certainly like an aspect of this whole situation that people feel um, empowered through some of the social media to reach out and and offer their commentary. Well, I just got to think that it's got to it's got to be negative because um, there's a lot of people that not just this case, but any case when you take on a defense that in the public they've already thought of the person as guilty, you know. So that's in a lot of cases. So um, all of the people that automat right away think, okay, Jody Aries is guilty, and how can you defend someone like that? That's just so wrong. Um, and now with the social media, it's, it's much more direct. Yeah, there's no doubt about it, you know, and I think that the closest parallel I can think of is, is the Casey Anthony trial, but I think, you know, that still occurred at a time when maybe Twitter and, and Facebook and some of these other things were at least somewhat in their infancy where all of us didn't, I know I didn't have a Twitter account back when Casey Anthony was under trial, but yeah, people... You know, that's part of the misunderstanding, right? That there's this visual of, of myself or, or, or Jose Baez or whomever it is. And, uh, you know, which is, which is, I guess, another ancillary reason why I wrote the book for people to understand that, look, no criminal defense attorney supports murder. Jose Baez wasn't defending Casey Anthony because he supports the killing of infants. He was there because, well, in his case, I guess he believed in his client's innocence. And even though the the public had, uh, you know, condemned her and and found her guilty in the court of public opinion. But, yes, uh, attorneys are there because they believe in the Constitution and they believe a person's constitutional rights uh, should be protected. And, you know, people on Twitter are just going to see the visual and have a gut reaction and say, how dare you do that? How dare you say that? And... It's just not. It's just not right. And I guess, kind of touching on what you said earlier, I guess that goes back to the to the other opinion of of the scrutiny I, I, I face. It's like, well, some of it, some of it really is is completely immaterial because it comes from a place of 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 a misunderstanding. And so, what's your relationship with uh, Jody Arias now? Well, I'm no longer Miss Arias' attorney, and so there, there, by and large, is no relationship. There need not be one. Um, it's over. And you plan on uh, ever, I guess you'll never work with her again, then? No, no. I, I well, never say never, but I, I could not conceive of a situation where, where that would, would happen. I mean, uh, I would not do so uh, voluntarily. Right. And and so now the whole effect of the case, um, you came out with your cancer diagnosis. Um, uh, tell us about that and how it's going now. Well, I did. And, and, you know, that's probably, you know, if there's if there is a bright side to the lack of anonymity and the uh, and the publicity, it's a chance to have a bully pulpit to talk about um, some issues and, and have you know, people on Twitter follow and understand, or, or like I said, being the, the have the chance for your listeners uh, to hear some of what I have to say in, in, in other ways on other topics. And you know, I, I tell the I've told the story in some of my blogs that uh, in August of 2015, late August, uh, I found a growth uh, or an inflammation uh, under my armpit, which was ultimately turned out to be. Uh, my lymph node, and uh, in September I, I had that removed, and um, it turned out to be uh, cancerous. It, it turned out that the diagnosis was that I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And one of the reasons I ultimately came out after I had 
the, the diagnosis called for six, six treatments of chemotherapy, and uh, I kept pretty private about it, uh, just telling friends and family because I didn't want people to, to treat me differently. And uh, so I, you know, kept forward, kept doing my business. And then in November, around the time of Thanksgiving, I, I had some test scans that showed that uh, that my my tumors had, had basically shrunk or, or were were undetectable. Uh, and so I, I realized that I probably was going to literally make it out alive, so to speak. And so I decided, you know, this is an opportunity for me to come forward and talk about it because I've heard statistics of, you know, however many people a day are diagnosed with cancer, and I kind of wanted to come out and use whatever stage I had to say, look, you can take this on, um, you should take it head on, because I remember some of my initial feelings. I remember some of the denial that I had, thinking, geez, you know, this can't be cancer, I feel too good. You know, I was running, I was working out, or, I don't know if you're familiar, I'd lost over 75 pounds between the two trials without the benefit of, of weight loss surgery, by the way, but I, I, I moved forward, I was feeling healthy, I thought, this can't be cancer, you know, I mean, I'd done a, some research online and, and knew that that's probably what it was, I thought, gosh, I'm feeling so good, this can't be cancer, but I forced myself to go to the doctor, I forced myself to confront it beyond, uh, you know, that initial diagnosis. I forced myself to go through the chemotherapy because I decided that it was worth the fight. And now here I am, uh, you know, we've just entered the month of March, but in uh, in January, the end of January, uh, I, my cancer was was determined to be in remission. Uh, I, all, all issues and restrictions related to my cancer are gone. Uh, I'm working out. I'm using my weight loss program. I authored a book on my weight loss program. Uh, I'll give a little plug for that. Uh, but I and I'm back doing that. I've lost 75 pounds of my what I'm calling my chemo weight, and I'm getting back into shape. And I'm just as healthy as I ever was. So working towards that goal anyway. Well, so yeah. to those to those listeners that are out there who might have got a diagnosis or might know someone who's got a diagnosis, I urge them to listen to what I say and take it on. You can live your life, and you can get past it. You're worth it. Oh, yeah, exactly. And and I'm, we're, we're glad you took it on and that, that things worked out and that uh, it's true. Um, I think you're right. Um, you got to face these things head on and and make the best out of it. And uh, that's a, you know, that's a big thing to overcome. No, no. Yeah, it really, it really is, you know. But you know, I think everybody's got to decide that 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 fight is worth it for them and them as a person. And if they if they have that attitude, then then I think they can uh, get past it. It's amazing since I came out how much support I had uh, amongst friends and family and and strangers. The positive side of social media, I guess, and um, you know how many people that have told me that, that what I said has, has helped them. And it's just, in that regard, it's just been such a blessing to come forward publicly. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've all got to support each other. Uh, did it, um, how do I say, so when this is happening to you, um, what do you think it is that people don't face up to when you find a lump or when you do something and you're saying this can't be cancer? Do you think it's just a form of denial? I think so. I mean, I think that's, you know, that's the word I use because, you know, when, when I had, when I found this, you know, um, it was hard for me to believe that it could be cancer because I was running, I was working out. I, you know, as a matter of fact, between the time I found it and by the time I could get in to see my doctor, I had taken a trip up to Seattle where I still have family and friends and I was walking several miles a day, going to baseball games, very energetic, no no problems at all. And I saw I saw no side effects, uh, no symptoms, if you will. You know, you look online, you see these symptoms, and I saw none of them. And I had the same response when I talked to my doctor. There were no symptoms, but there was cancer because the scan showed there was cancer. And I, that's the biggest thing. Don't don't kind of live in that denial because I easily could have done that. I easily could have said, ah, you know, no way. This is just something that will go away in a few weeks. 
and that would have put me a few weeks behind. That would have put my made my tumors that much bigger. No, got, you got to go in there. Don't don't be in denial. And if it's not, great. But if if you live in that denial, you're you're not confronting the cancer as early as possible. And I think any cancer doctor will tell you early detection is, is the key to victory. So so don't don't be fooled by that denial. Go in and see your doctor. Yeah, yeah, very very good advice. So one other thing, have you, speaking of social media, I was thinking, um, do you realize that there's a free Jody Arias and Facebook and all that, and there's like 50,000 people following it? Yeah, you know, I, I don't. I, I don't follow all of that. I don't keep up. You know, one of the things I, I talk about in the book is Miss Arias having a, a personality akin to a cult leader. Um, so a lot of people, you know, follow uh, her and and believe in her and for what, whatever reasons they have, uh, but you know it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me at all. Like we talked earlier about that that thirst for knowledge. You know, I uh, I, I remember a few weeks back. I think uh, I was on Nancy Grace. Uh, Miss Arias had had called a prison guard a derogatory uh, sexual slur, and there was a. Uh, Gail, a uh, phone call of her interview talking about what she was eating and things of that nature. And, and you know, the, the, the thirst for knowledge was there. And so, yes, it doesn't surprise me that there's all that out there. Yeah, that's great. But she, she, I, what I don't understand is she, she admitted to killing him. So what is it that they're hoping for, do you think? Like, wh- there's no doubt that she killed Travis Alexandra. There's... Well, you know, I, I don't know. You know, I, I was asked this question a while back. I did a, a, a interview with a Facebook uh, group that was focused on true crimes. And the question was, what do I think of Jody Harris' supporters? And I said, you know, my response was, I'm not sure what they support. And, you know, I guess I would share your confusion. I'm sure a lot of them, you know, believe that, you know, it was an act of self-defense, and I was such an inept defense attorney that I couldn't prove it, things of that nature. I speculate that on my, on my book, but but honestly, I, I I share your confusion. Okay, good. So it's just not me. I thought <laughs> I thought maybe I was missing. <laughs> well, I thought I was missing. No, something. no, I'm not. No, it's, it's definitely not you. And and so you know, I I just I just don't know what to what to say. Although I, I attribute that a lot to Miss Harris's. Uh, well, yeah, uh, I, abilities, if you will. Yeah, I just couldn't figure it out because all, all the write-ups on the page are about all the things uh, Juan Martinez did wrong and and that he lied and all this and and it's all free Jody Arias is the page and and I'm, every, everything's about that. But I I just don't get it. I mean, free or she killed someone and and brutally. I <laughs> I'm, I'm just confused. I'm <laughs> but. What was the biggest? Well, you know, you know what I always say too. You know, from our, to my understanding, somebody married Charles Manson within the last year. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, you just never know. People are going to uh, believe what they want to believe and have concepts that they're going to that they're going to want to hang on to. What was the biggest surprise in the case for you? Uh, I guess probably, you know, it would be like going back to what I said, the, the fact that it became such a worldwide phenomenon, I think is surprising um, because there's a lot of cases that probably have a lot of some similar dynamics that just don't become that. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I remember, you know, hearing from people in Australia and New Zealand and all over the world uh, that were following the case, and I think that became became pretty shocking because you know you, me, I was in this bubble trying to try the case, and and to think that people, for example, in Australia were watching the trial, uh, it's amazing to me. And I hear from people, uh, reasonable people, that that would tell me that they were watching the trial and that they followed it every day, and and that that really is is very surprising. Now that it's it's over for her, right? Like she's uh, sentenced to life. Um, I guess that's it now. Well, she has she has one appeal, and certainly I can't comment on the viability of her appeal. But she has 
one guaranteed appeal to the uh, Arizona Court of Appeals, and then uh, no, no other appeals. Uh, no other appeals are automatic. Just amazing case. Uh, now, what's up for um, for you next? Well, you know, I am uh, working on the second book. I do not have a, a time frame. Uh, I get a lot on social media, and, and even these interviews, people ask me, when's that second book coming out? I don't know. The statement I made in the first book was that it would be 2016, and, and uh, so I've got nine more months to make good on that, but obviously I was, I was dealing with some cancer-related issues there, too. But uh, I'm working on my second book. Uh, I have a couple other uh, projects in the works, and you know, now that I am no longer going through chemotherapy, I am um, working uh, back at my law office, taking on clients, and uh, I'm still, you know, I, I've got the weight loss book. It's called Trimmer More There. It's a silly thing my wife said, and I'm working on uh, losing weight and proving proving again uh, that the program that I outline. Uh, in that book is is a viable option for for people who want to lose weight. I think uh, you know, along with my cancer diagnosis and my success losing weight uh, in the first place as a healthy individual, um, you know, weight loss and things like that are are certainly always going to be a part of of my career moving forward. So, oh, that's great. That's great. Well. Um... I have to say, thank you very much um, for taking the time and and talking to us about this, and uh, uh, we wish you nothing but the best. I appreciate it, and I I really enjoyed talking to you here today. I said I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. I said I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. You're listening to the House of Mystery on KFNX 1100 AM, Independent Talk Radio. And joining us is the fiery prosecutor who convicted notorious Jody Arias for the killing of her boyfriend, Travis Alexandra. And he's speaking openly for the first time about his new book, Conviction, The Untold Story of Putting Jody Arias Behind Bars. Thank you for taking some time for us today. Well, thank you for asking me to speak with you. I appreciate it. In your book, you talked about the tactics you utilized in your prosecution of Jody. What was one of them that sticks out? Uh, the, the uh, I guess the, from a sort of global perspective, the, the bigger thing that uh, I put out there is the, the uh, strategy that I employed um, during the trial. Um, I knew, for example, that uh, she, uh, she meaning uh, Jody Arias, had... Uh, actually planned, not only premeditated the murder, but planned to kill Travis Alexander. And part of that plan included uh, these gas cans, uh, and they became sort of symbolic in the case. Uh, and we all know about them now, but I actually chose to not speak of them in opening statement because I wanted to wait to uh, to sort of present them uh, during a cross-examination at a time that they would have the most impact uh, so during uh, opening statements, I didn't say anything about them, and uh, in fact, I didn't. Uh, I didn't actually even say anything about them during the case uh, in chief that I presented. As I said, I waited until the defense uh, put on their case, as they say, and um, I uh, waited until the ex-boyfriend was on the witness stand to ask him about whether or not he had a conversation with Jody Arias in the early part of uh, the later part of May, uh, where she requested uh, to borrow two gas cans because she was going to be traveling to uh, Mesa, Arizona. And, of course, I, I remember that he sort of gulped when I asked him that. It was a quiet sort of pause, and then he admitted that. But um, So it's the, the strategy of when I decided, for example, to use this part of the gas cans. And, again, to continue with the threat of the gas the, uh, the, the issue of the gas cans is uh, uh, I also knew, had been able to find out from looking at receipts and following up on that lead, that she actually um, bought a third gas can and uh, and had actually now had a total of three gas three five gallon gas cans a total of fifteen gallons and I was able to determine that as part of uh, her plan uh, she wanted to travel through Arizona without having to stop for gas and uh, if you compute it out you actually can make it through Arizona from California all the way to Nevada if you just have that extra fifteen gallons uh, of gas and so strategically speaking I didn't. Uh, 
let on about the third gas can either. And uh, I know in the opening statement, the uh, defense counsel indicated that, no, it was for the moment that uh, she just called Mr. Alexander and decided to come. And uh, I knew sitting there that that was something that I could dispute because I knew about the gas cans. And so, and then uh, lastly, I waited uh, to the very end to ask her about it. And I said, well, if you didn't have this third gas can, why is it that you were filling it up in Salt Lake City? And at that point, that's when she sort of shrugged her shoulders and kind of had that look about her that you, you caught me kind of thing. And, of course, she recovered nicely and said, well, I never was in Salt Lake City. So, and of course, I could show she had been there. So, I, I mean, it's, it's things like that, the strategy, what, what I was thinking when I was presenting the evidence. Your prosecution strategy was quite bullish, and some people really liked the way you performed, and some people didn't. Yeah, some people really, um, I mean, the, the bigger criticism that I got was that I, during the cross-examination of uh, some of the witnesses, and specifically her, that I was a bit too strident and maybe, uh, you know, was, was, a, was a, bit, a bit too strong in the way that I uh, questioned uh, her. But um, with her, um, had I not employed that tactic, and that's what it was, it was part of the strategy, um, she would have controlled the questioning, and I would have not, uh, and, and, it, and it would have been just a situation where she would have uh, given me the same story that she'd been telling all along about how he had attacked her and uh, somehow there was some sort of this sexual abuse component to the domestic violence that she was claiming. So I needed to get straight answers. And so when I said, is that yes or no, uh, people sort of decided that perhaps that was, that's, that was a bit too harsh. But yes, I, there was some criticism about it. Yeah, I think you sort of had to. Uh, she was not the normal sort of gal that she appeared to be. She was quite quite uh, a smart girl and very manipulative, wasn't she? Yeah, I, she. that's one thing about her. I, she sat there and she had the librarian look about her. She had that whole thing going, but underneath it, uh, she. Uh, you, 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 as you step back, one of the things that you can do is you can underestimate the person that uh, that's on the other side, in this case, uh, Jody Arias. I'm, I'm never going to be a person who's going to say that she wasn't uh, extremely well prepared for what she did. And she was very thorough in her preparations, um, going to such lengths as when the police are out at the crime scene, she's calling in as the ex-girlfriend, pretending that she, you know, she doesn't know anything about it. I, I mean, she, she was extremely manipulative. She would take uh, something that you knew was not true and spin it in such a way that you almost believed her. So I never underestimated her, and uh, as I sit here today, I believe she's intelligent, and I believe she knew everything that she was doing, and, uh, you know, the, the planning, it was, it was, it was incredible. And, and that is meant in, although it sounds like I'm being positive in, in my remarks about her, uh, one can't help, can't help but say it was very well planned. Yeah, she was very good at it. Uh, I remember her throwing things at you about your posture and your stance sort of throwing her <laughs> off so she couldn't remember, you know? Right, and that was part of the strategy because then it would, uh, she was trying to come up, make me look like I was uh, a bully and, and, you know, that I was, again, like Travis, that I was trying to attack her. But, but uh, you know, the jury saw their way through it and saw that uh, that was just, uh, just, just sort of a strategy on her part in an effort or an attempt not to answer the questions. Yeah, I still think it's quite amazing to be able to hold your composure like she did, knowing that you're on trial for a murder that you're, you know, there's a lot of evidence. There, there was, and she, she never lost her composure except for that one time when I asked her about the gas can. Uh, throughout the whole thing, if she, if uh, she was grasping for an answer, what she would do is she would say, well, I can't remember, or I'm in a fog, or uh, she would take issue with the word, for example, do you have a, a mental issue, or do you have a mental problem or something? Uh, she would say, well, I don't like the word issue. Okay, uh, how about the word problem? Well, I don't like that. Well, I like that word. So it, 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 she would play word games up there when uh, she would sort of be grasping for an answer until uh, she bought time so that she could effectively answer the question so that at least she, she would give a, a rendition that, again, uh, you know, there, there was something to it, and you'd have to always sort of be very careful. Now, uh, losing the death penalty must have been kind of hard. I, I know a lot of Americans were frustrated by that. Um, with, with regard to any sentence, and specifically the sentence in this case, I, I, I never look back and I never uh, concern myself or worry about uh, what a jury may have done or what a judge may have done in terms of the sentence. 
I actually, as soon as it's pronounced, I leave it there and I move on. Other than that, it would uh, it would make my life miserable. I would uh, be living in the past, and um, I, fortunately, and maybe that's why I still am working there and working at the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, and why I will continue to work there for for some time is that um, I live in the in the present and I look to the future. So um, as soon as they pronounce the sentence, I moved on and. Uh, you know, our legal system is the best in the world, and, and I'm happy to work in it. And finally, what was the reason for you to write the book? Uh, and one of the things that we've been talking about here is that how she, how well she planned it and how she had all these stories and how on the witness stand she came across sort of wayfish, and the stories almost seem believable. And uh, uh, in my view, um, there's a lesson to be learned here that uh, no matter how well you plan something, no matter how smart you really are or you think you are, um, you're not going to get away with it. Um, this is not something that uh, she should have gotten away with. And uh, as we've seen, uh, you know, in the, in the, 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 the sort of the, 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 uh, the trial, tri- high-profile trials that are out there, there have been some very high-profile acquittals. My view in putting this book out is to say you can't get away with murder. Uh, perhaps others may have. I don't know. Um, I know there have been some high-profile acquittals. At least not in this case. You can't get away with murder. Our guest, Juan Martinez, prosecutor and author, the book Conviction, the untold story of putting Jody Arias behind bars. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you for uh, having me on your show. show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of the Z-Talk Radio Network. I'll be back.